Good morning, everyone. My name is Cynthia Johnson, and um, welcome to the final session of the 1619 Project Series. On behalf of the Fourth Church Edu Adult Education Committee, my co-host, Marilyn Esri, Alan Bath, and I hope that you've enjoyed the sessions and that you've become more enlightened about the history of racial inequality in our country. And thank you very much for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to cover just a couple of housekeeping items. You have all been muted so that we don't experience background noise during Professor Hunt's presentation. When it's time for the Q&A at the end of his presentation, for those of you in, at the church, you can ask your questions, Professor Hunt, will repeat the question so that those of you who are online can hear the question clearly stated. For those of you who are, are online, if you have a question, please put your question in the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat and we will answer as many questions as possible. Please in, keep in mind that we have quite a few participants at today's session, both online and in person, so we may not be able to get to all of your questions, but we will do the best we can. Before I introduce today's speaker, let us pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and our minds today. Expand our capacity to embrace equality, diversity, and inclusion in our church and our community. Lord, give us hope to those who are gathered here today. Just as our church is a light in the city, lead us to shine a light on racial injustice. Give us the presence of mind to remember that we are all created in your image. Let us be mindful that as Dr. Martin Luther King said, when something happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. I humbly ask that you help us fulfill our purpose and thank you for leading our way forward on our anti-racism journey. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It is my honor to introduce you to Brett Hunt, professor and chair of the Department of History at Loyola University. Brett became the professor and chair of the Department of History on July 1st in 2020. He leads a talented group of 30 full-time faculty that has produced award-winning scholarship, trained new generations of historians in its MA and PhD programs, and supports a nationally recognized graduate program in public history. From 2015 to 20. 20, Brad served as Vice President for Research and Academic Programs at the Newberry Library in Chicago. He oversaw a highly competitive fellowship program that brought over 50 scholars to the library each year. He guided four research centers, coordinated two research intensive undergraduate seminars, and guided a range of public programming adult seminars and programs for teachers. Prior to Loyola in the Newberry, Brad was a Dean and Vice Provost at Roosevelt University in Chicago, guiding the university's adult degree completion program among others. Prior to his administrative appointment, Brad was a professor, professor of social science and history teaching a variety of interdisciplinary seminars for returning adults, as well as courses in the sustainability studies program at the history department. He received a PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley in, in 2000 and his BA from Williams College in 1990. In 2019, Brad led the Newberry Library's 1919 project in partnership with 13 Chicago cultural institutions 
to confront the history of Chicago's 1919 race riots and their legacies today. The project won the National Council on Public History's 2020 Outstanding Public History Award. Brad describes the, six, the 1919 project as both simple and complex to spark the conversation among Chicagoans about the ugly past and to understand the present and chart a better way forward in the city's future. Brad states, and I quote, difficult history makes people uncomfortable, but ignoring events like the riots in which the majority of the victims were black and the majority of the aggressors were white males means that we're not doing the healing work. We all have a responsibility to know and understand this past. There's so little dis discussion. I want people to understand that where we are today just didn't happen, end quote. Please join me in welcoming Professor Brad Hunt for an engaging conversation about the 1619 Project. Thank you. Brad, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Cynthia, for that introduction. I appreciate uh, that work that you've done along with Alan Bath and Marilyn Esri and Fred Hickler to make this series possible. I'm really honored to be uh, on a program that includes the Reverend Joe Morrow, Natalie Moore, who I've worked with on many projects, and Dr. David Daniels. I learned a lot from those first three sessions, and I'm really grateful to be uh, here for the final one. I want to accomplish several things today. Uh, I want to, uh, several goals for today. First, what is briefly the 1619 Project. I wanna make sure we understand it because I think it's been misunderstood a bit. I wanna confront uh, the reactions of academic historians, that's like me, how, what are, how do professional historians see this? Uh, we also wanna understand the reaction of the conservative right and, and understand where they're coming from. Uh, finally, we wanna talk about, not finally, we wanna talk about teaching the 1619 Project and then get back to my fundamental question, what is history for, uh, the way I've titled this talk. Uh, but we also want to ask, what can we do going forward? This question, what is history for, uh, may seem like an obvious one, but it really asks, why should we care so much about the past? And I want to tell you an anecdote. I'll give you a story from my daughter who asked me at a young age, about age 11. She asked, Dad, why do you like history so much? They're all dead. And uh, I, I forgave her for that bit of blasphemy uh, because it really is a good question. Why should we spend so much energy on what happened, particularly this painful and difficult history that we're talking about today, history of slavery, the history of racism, the history of our divides. I think this crowd, I hope, gets it, uh, that we need to understand how we arrived at our present condition how the things we see around us happened? What, how did these vast inequalities in things like wealth, income, education, healthcare, criminal justice, how do these things happen? They all have a long history with contingent moments, times when things could have gone differently, times when alternate paths were available. But there are also these large scale structures and ideologies and the exercise of power that create the context in which those choices and paths were made available, in which they either broadened or narrowed. So uh, in today's talk, I approach the 1619 Project as an historian, thinking about those ideas I just mentioned, contingency, context, causality. I also think about power, language, structure. And I think about, uh, this is to paraphrase the musical Hamilton, uh, who gets to tell the story? Who gets to tell these stories? Uh, who gets to, to tell differing perspectives? And how can we have empathy towards those perspectives? Finally, I wanna to turn to a theme that Natalie Moore uh, brought up in her presentation two weeks ago. She said, white people, white people need to do the work of understanding this history. And white folks need to talk to white folks about it. I think that's right. We place the burden of understanding so much of this history and teaching this history 
on those who uh, have struggled the most with it. Not that we want to blame individuals that are alive today for events that happened 100 or 400 years ago. No, that's, that's not a constructive exercise, but we can be honest with ourselves, honest about our past, honest about its successes and failures in a productive way that helps us better understand how we got here. If we bury that past, if we don't understand the broad forces that have shaped where we are today, then we cannot address the problems of today. Certainly, it is a human trait to want to bury this stuff, to focus only on our strengths, not be reminded of weaknesses, but we've dodged our historical failures and we've often explained them away. That's not a good look when we're trying to understand our present condition. We're largely left with two paths to go down. One, we can do a lot more history and a lot more sociology and maybe psychology and other social science disciplines, even humanities disciplines, and understand and recognize the broad structural forces and racism that have pounded African Americans over hundreds of years and that continue to this day to shape those disparities. Or two, we can uh, choose another path, one that argues that I'm not responsible. Other uh, individuals are responsible for their own fate. They determine their own outcomes to their own individual choices. And those choices are made essentially in a vacuum without any context, any exercise of power, any privilege. And that's how outcomes uh, are determined. If we adapt that individualistic model and then try to understand the group outcomes, we're left ultimately with a racist conclusion that the large scale disparities we see today must indicate something wrong with the race, a racialized inferiority. That of course is completely unacceptable, completely unacceptable racist view, but it's exactly what we're up against in the 21st century. And it, it wins a lot of votes. Nearly half of Americans voted for a president who exuded those ideas I just mentioned, that individualistic notion, denied any larger social forces, denied any context or any privilege contributed to outcomes, including uh, his own wealth and success. So that's where I'm coming from. I wanna lay that on the table. Those are the big ideas in the back of my head, why history matters, why things like the 1619 Project matter, why we need to understand this past. History is not dead, the people are maybe not no longer with us, uh, but we need to understand this stuff. This is heavy. Uh, this is not easy. This is difficult history, as Cynthia mentioned. Uh, but let's dig in. Okay. So what is the 1619 Project? Uh, this started as a special edition of the New York Times Magazine. Here's a copy of it. Time to coincide with the 400th anniversary of the introduction of slavery in British colonial America at Jamestown. This cover photo is looking out to the sea, out to the Middle Passage, thinking about the vast distances that enslaved Africans must have traveled. Uh, it has since been expanded into a book. Uh, uh, this is the, the from the website, and this ship appears, and this is this hinge moment. When a ship appears, it's since been advanced to a book. I, I highly recommend it. I have it here. Uh, it's signed by Nicole Hannah-Jones, I'm proud to say. That was a great moment. Uh, and also a children's book. And finally, a curriculum uh, that is taking place uh, under the sponsorship of the Pulitzer Center. But when we talk about the 1619 Project, most of what we think about is this introductory essay from Nicole Hannah-Jones, which tries to reframe American history, centering slavery and enslavement as a central force. Uh, it's a 7,500 word essay. It's a polemical essay. It's certainly one that's uh, meant to start a conversation. It reflects on her own personal story, much as Reverend Joe Morrow did uh, in our first session. Uh, just as Reverend Morrow asked, how should we start our stories? Where do we begin? And as he walked through that in his own life, uh, we have here Hannah Jones starting in 1619. It's a convenient 400th anniversary. It's really a rhetorical reset, turning attention away from other starting points like 1776 and lasering in on slavery as the central force. Uh, it hits hard at the hypocrisies of 1776. She writes that the United States 
is a nation founded on both an ideal, that ideal being that all men are created equal, and a lie that slavery is embedded uh, in our democracy. I wanna come back to this. We're gonna talk more about it, um, but I think we'd miss a lot if all we did was focus on this essay. This is a large book that collects uh, many essays and additional poetry. Uh, there were in fact 18 essays, and I wanna share just a few with you to give you a flavor for the broad, uh, for the depth and breadth of this project. Matthew Desmond, a sociologist, has a, a piece, another provocative piece linking slavery and capitalism. In order to understand the brutality of American capitalism, you have to start on the plantation. That, um, that our versions of, of capitalism have been shaped in ways by that institution of slavery, by the work practices, the accounting practices, uh, the, the market forces that were driven by a plantation economy in the American South. Another example from the, uh, the, the collection, Khalil Gibran Muhammad links slavery and our consumption, that sugar, the sugar that we eat that saturates our diet has a barbaric history as the white gold that fueled slavery. Sugar, I'm gonna come back to sugar, is a particularly uh, brutal crop to raise and uh, it was uh, one that had incredibly high death rates uh, among the enslaved. So uh, this is, there are 18 total. Uh, I encourage you to get the book. And I, I think it's a really interesting compilation of, of provocative essays intended to make us think. Okay, uh, one more here, Danielle Bowman. So this is not actually in the book, this is on their website. It talks about monuments and I'm very interested in this public history question. Loyola University has a fine public history program. We're always interested in how to communicate with a public uh, about this past and monuments have been a current battleground. We know that monuments are getting toppled. For hundreds of years, enslaved people were bought and sold in America. Those sites have been forgotten. Today, we have monuments to uh, Confederate soldiers, Confederate generals. This is changing rapidly. Uh, it's, it's a part of this past that we have to confront. When should these things come down? When should they st stay? I wanna take you now uh, to the reaction by academic historians to the 1619 Project. This is my world a little bit. It's a little inside baseball perhaps, but I think, uh, what the, I think this is an important context for understanding this. Most academic historians, most professional historians have a positive reaction to the 1619 Project. They see it as forcefully written. It's building on three decades, four decades of existing scholarship. And it draws attention to, uh, to vital history. They are fine with centering slavery in the American narrative. Uh, but of course, there are some negative responses and I wanna address those uh, in a bit. So the central question, I wanna frame the way historians think about the central question of American history, what's at stake in the 1619 Project? And it's a kind of simple binary. Now, I wanna say historians like to complexify things, so don't, uh, I, I think, you know, don't read too much into this, but this is a provocative way to, uh, to think about the problem and sometimes the way I teach it was America a society with slavery? Did we happen to have slavery? It was this kind of stain on our, our past. It's something that, oh yeah, that was bad. Uh, it was something in the American South. It was something that uh, was unfortunate. People were conflicted about it. Um, ultimately, we, it's not central to who we are. Or were we a slave society, fundamentally? Two opposite poles. Uh, a slave society, one where slavery was central to our economy, central to our politics, central to our culture, not just in the South, it infected the American, uh, the, the North, colonial North and the American North uh, in the ways that trade, uh, capital, uh, uh, cultural ideas about difference, all of that infected uh, the American project and were we in fact a slave society. Uh, I think this is the fundamental tension that we're probably somewhere in between, but we're also a slave society in many respects. And this is where historians have been going. Historians have also been broadening the story globally to make sure we understand that the American story is just one part 
of, not, it's not just an American problem, this is a global problem. Uh, this is a, a complicated map of the transatlantic slave trade, probably difficult to read on your screen, but the big thrust of it is that a whole lot of people were enslaved in Africa. Most of them went to South America and the Caribbean, not to uh, North America. Now, now, what's the point here? Why, why does this mean we're not so bad? Uh, it's a different, more complex story. First of all, the story in the South, South America and in the Caribbean was a sugar story. And sugar, as I said, was an incredibly difficult crop and high mortality rates. And if people are dying that you bring over as you work them literally to death, you need more people. And so you enslave in, in, in enormous numbers. This is a roughly four million uh, enslaved peoples, four to six million enslaved peoples. It's, it, there's difference uh, in the data on this. There's an excellent article today, by the way, in the Sunday New York Times, thanks to my aunt Trish for uh, sending that to me. She may be on the Zoom. Thanks, Aunt Trish. Uh, this was uh, today's Sunday Review by Jamel Bowie about the data involved in amassing this. And it's really taken us 30 to 40 years as historians to get a handle on uh, a real data set of the slave voyages. And with that, we can do these kinds of maps. But so what about um, only a handful of, not a handful, only about three to 4% of enslaved Africans come directly from Africa to North America. What does that mean? So uh, there's an implication here for the US. There were only, if only about 400,000 uh, enslaved Africans made it to the British, co British colonies uh, and the early America, well, how did we end up with 4 million enslaved people by the Civil War? Most slaves in the United States were born here and enslaved here. And now we get to some difficult history. It's difficult to even talk about this because of the high price of an enslaved person. Slave owners had a tremendous incentive to literally grow their wealth, expand their assets through human reproduction. And they have a huge incentive to do so. So forced reproduction, often through violence, often through rape is a part of the American narrative of how we go from only 400,000 people arriving on the shores to 4 million enslaved people um, by the Civil War. Uh, that's an element of difficult history we don't want to talk about. We want to bury that. It's human nature to bury that. Uh, but it's certainly um, a, a part of the American narrative. And how do we deal with that? Um, we bury it and we don't talk about uh, the, a large portion of our workforce got, was enslaved and got paid nothing. And that wealth is what generated uh, uh, the, so many of the institutions we have today. The, uh, many of the universities on the East Coast, Brown University, Georgetown University, others have confronted their history quite well. Others are still wrestling with it. Uh, that workforce helped build the White House and the Capitol. It helped build Faneuil Hall in Boston, uh, Trinity Church in Manhattan. These things are being built in the North with uh, enslaved people and um, also with the wealth uh, that comes from enslavement. And at certain times in American history, certain industries have generated fantastical wealth. Uh, we think in, in, after the Civil War, we could name railroads or oil or automobiles or consumer goods or today the information economy. It's generated enormous, uh, enormous profits. Before the Civil War, it was the enslavement of Africans of African-Americans. Without enslavement, we would have had been in a struggling agrarian society, maybe some light manufacturing, certainly not the vast wealth uh, that we uh, had at the start of the Civil War. And it's not just Southern plantation owners, and Northern merchants who participated in this trade, bankers, insurers who financed enslavement, distilleries in the North that processed sugar, mills that processed cotton, all tied up in enslaved labor. Let me tell you, walk through uh, one uh, example. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk more about sugar and show you some uh, images. This is bringing us the, the vast enslavement of people. A million uh, enslaved Africans end up on Jamaica, almost a million in Cuba. These tiny islands have hundreds of thousands of slaves, islands we may have visited, like uh, Aruba, uh, Antigua, excuse me, where sugar production, this is a stylized image, 1823. Yes, work is going on. It doesn't begin to depict the brutality uh, and the mortality rates of people working in these environments uh, in uh, cutting cane, 
processing cane, boiling cane, producing the sugar that will end up generating enormous wealth because there's huge demand for sugar in Europe, huge demand around the world, really, for sugar. If there's something that this, the 1619 project is starting to bring this, is bring this history more to the public. If historians not know this, no, they've known this for 50 years. They, it's, it's a question of how do we bring this to the public? Another element of the 1619 project that historians have been developing also for the last 30 years is resistance and the resistance of enslaved people to their oppression. And this is still a very much an undeveloped history in, in the public view. I have a depiction here of a uprising from 1811, uh, the German coast uprising. I was in New Orleans in December and got to tour uh, a plantation that was at uh, part of this resistance. This is an image from 1888. It clearly has racist elements in it. Uh, we have to recognize that the stories of resistance have often been told by white historians and diminished or otherwise uh, downplayed or presented these paths as um, not worthy of, of our attention and of, of aberrant. And in fact, there were over 250 documented instances uh, of at least more than 10 enslaved people uh, rebelling in open rebellion. And then there's also all sorts of other forms of resistance, be it running away, work slowdowns. Uh, the, uh, historians have, have started to uh, uncover these in ways that complicate the narrative of enslavement, that this was not enslaved people being happy on the plantation as Southern historians had wanted to explain for de decades of the 20th century. In fact, it's a constant conflict. Uh, in fact, another element of the historical narrative that historians have latched onto that's uh, barely touched uh, in the 1619 project was one that we're spending a lot of time on is teaching students about the Haitian rebellion of 1791 to 1804. Very complicated story, not going to give you the synopsis. Really interesting history in terms of the complexity of Creole and slave cultures of the French who were making a fortune in Haiti. It was this gold mine, in essence, in terms of the profits that could be made on sugar. It was helping finance their wars in Europe. Napoleon desperately wanted to hold on to it. He sends a bunch of troops. The Haitian enslaved and Creole uh, army that fights back, uh, eventually defeats the French. Uh, Napoleon sells the Louisiana Purchase in part to, uh, because he no longer thinks uh, the Caribbean is the future for the French. I mean, this global implications barely a paragraph in most history textbooks, uh, if that, on the Haitian rebellion and revolution. Um, it does come back to, you know, historians have also, uh, let's turn to the controversy. Historians have also been critical of the 1619 project. And here, uh, this has gotten a lot of attention in the media, certainly. Some historians think this is wrong, that the American Revolution and slavery, the way it's treated in the project is just not right, that Abraham and Lincoln and slavery are getting a, a raw deal, and that uh, abolitionists uh, and civil rights leaders and slavery are also uh, treated uh, without the without uh, improperly. And I wanna dig into each of these. Uh, this in part blew up because there were fact checkers who pushed the New York Times in different directions, particularly on that issue of the American Revolution. Leslie Harris here is a professor at Northwestern University, highly regarded uh, African-American historian who was not comfortable with the way uh, the article treated uh, slavery in the American Revolution. Let me tell you what this is all about. It's rather small potatoes uh, in my mind, but let me show you what it's about. Here's what was published on August 14th, 2019 in that New York Times Magazine that came in the middle of my Sunday paper. This sentence, one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare their independence from Britain in 1776 was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Uh, this is a bold statement. Uh, the, one of the primary reasons, uh, I think, that it lumps all colonists together, and it's probably a stretch too far. It's a bridge too far. Uh, it does take away a whole lot of reasons. The American Revolution was an extremely complex event. 
people had a whole lot of motivations for either siding with the revolution, and many sided with the crown, with the British Empire, uh, with England. Uh, here was it revised. The sentence eventually gets revised. Nicole Hannah-Jones uh, steps back from it and says, one of the primary reasons some of the colonists decided to declare their independence from Britain was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. This is a, remember, this is a short essay. She's not going to go into all of the history. It's 7,500 words. This sentence is defensible and I think um, reasonable, particularly in the American South, where in 1775, the governor of Virginia threatened to offer freedom to enslaved peoples to join the British Army to uh, begin to build up an army to fight uh, any kind of revolutionary impulse of the colonists. This definitely, if you were a slaveholder, many slaveholders sided with the British, fearing, um, I mean, sided with the revolution, fearing that Britain would uh, uh, free, free the enslaved or turn to abolition. So that, that well, those two little words have, have fostered a ton of controversy. Uh, prominent historians wrote a letter. This eventually uh, resulted in this retraction. Yeah, we need to get this right. And I think this is an improvement. I don't think it's central to the entire essay uh, at all. Uh, it's an example of, uh, I think, historians wanting their say, uh, wanting to put their stamp of complexity on um, issues that are, are already difficult to understand. Um, so I, I treat this as part of the business of journalism versus history. Uh, and I think there's sometimes some professional jealousy among historians who haven't been able to get their arguments out uh, in the same way that say the power of the New York Times uh, running a major project. Let's keep going on this. Uh, even in the historians who critique the uh, American Revolution point, uh, they eventually said, we applaud all efforts to address the enduring centrality of slavery and race into our history. They're not objecting to the broad arc of the project. They're objecting to that portrayal of the American Revolution. And I, I think uh, the, they were largely right, but um, it's just not uh, their tone and then their aggressiveness um, made this, gave ammunition in essence to uh, the right who are particularly opposed. Let's go on to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, okay. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was an opponent, you know, is, is either Lincoln an opponent of slavery and a great emancipator, or is he a white man who did not want social equality for African Americans? Yeah, the essay sets this up as the latter. Uh, I think that's a simplistic notion, too. We can have both. He was, in fact, both. Another small point needs to be um, put in some context. The Civil Rights Movement and Abolitionists, as published on August 14th, 2019, for the most part, Black Americans fought alone against 20th century oppression. Uh, similarly, abolitionism gets a kind of a short shrift. Yeah, this is about how much credit do we give to various peoples for uh, the progress we've made? And I think that we have perhaps neglected too much the work of African Americans in their own resistance. And that's where uh, historians tend to uh, want to have it both ways, and they want both. And I think that that is good. But this is a weakness of any project that's just a short um, essay. Let's go to the reaction by the conservative right, the 1776 project. The 1776 report, excuse me, deliberately stated uh, in, in, contra, in contradiction to uh, the 1619 project, it reasserts a, a conservative agenda around freedom uh, and uh, the ideologies of the founding fathers displayed here in the National Archives. President Trump gave a speech that day, uh, it was very aggressive. Here it is. All right, my notes. Uh, let me read to you from this impromptu White House Conference on American History, which had uh, no historic professional historians, but instead several conservative political scientists and conservative activists. He said at this uh, at this speech, "quote The left wing rioting and mayhem." that we see today are the direct result of decades of left-wing indoctrination in our schools. It's gone on far too long, 
our children are instructed from propaganda tracts like those uh, like those of Howard Zinn, an historian, that try to make students ashamed of their own history. The left has warped, distorted, and defiled the American story with deceptions, falsehoods, and lies. There's no better example than the New York Times totally discredited 1619 Project. This project rewrites American history to teach our children that we were founded on the principle of oppression, not freedom. Nothing could be further from the truth. He then goes on to link uh, the 1619 Project with critical race theory, which is part of this uh, conservative effort to reshape that term into a overall catch-all for uh, efforts to talk about structural racism in America. Uh, and he says, you know, the critical race theory, the 1619 Project, and the crusade against American history is toxic propaganda. It's ideological poison that, if not removed, will dissolve the civic bonds that tie us together. It will destroy our country. Uh, the report, this, that, that's probably not a speech he came up with on, on his own, uh, but uh, it ends up forming the 1776 Commission. Again, no professional historians produces that report, and the report uh, really is intended to restore a version of history that we have not been teaching for a long time, restoring patriotic education that tells the truth about America. Doesn't mean ignoring the faults in our past. Okay, nod to slavery. That's the society with slavery, but rather viewing our history clearly and wholly with reverence and love. This is about teaching students to love their country. We must also prioritize personal responsibility, remember that theme from early in my talk, fulfilling the duties that we have towards one another's mm -hmm. citizens. Above all, we must stand up to the petty tyrants in every sphere who demand that we speak only of America's sins while denying her greatness at home, in school, in the workplace, in the world. We have the power to stand up for America and defend our way of life. I mean, this is these two are opposite poles, 1619 uh, and the 1776 commission report are, are opposite poles. Uh, I want to come back to this. I want to put this in some context. There has been a long history of history wars, as historians call them. Textbooks have been debated, fought over. Here's just a relatively new book about the textbook war of 1961-62 in Texas. Texas leads the way in part because of their market power among publishers. So many students in Texas, so uh, textbooks get written that way. It's continued into 2010. We're still fighting over textbooks in many respects. Um, conservatives unhappy with uh, the way American history is presented, want it to be truly patriotic education. But the way we're teaching the 1619 Project in high school, I, I think there's this boogeyman out there that thinks, oh, we've, we've, uh, this curriculum has been adopted wholesale. It's barely beginning to be introduced uh, into high schools. It has not been informing the last 30 years. Uh, this is a photograph that's actually, um, coincidentally, the uh, teacher, my daughter had at Whitney Young High School. I only know that because I sat in that classroom and I think that's looks familiar. Uh, she's not pictured here, but they all had a copy of the New York Times um, piece that was intended to introduce this to high school students. It's usually one unit, maybe a week. That Pulitzer Center website is still very much under development. Uh, it's not, there's not a set curriculum here. Uh, teachers are wrestling with how to introduce this in their classroom. I talked to a friend of mine, a historian, teaches in a New York suburb, New York City suburb. He's like, yeah, I bring the 1619 Project in, but we do it uh, in the way that the same, he does it the same way I do it in college, which is to pair these two and say, we've got two very different interpretations here. How do you want to wrestle with this? Let's think about how historians do their work and recognize these as different lenses, different approaches. Which ones do you feel more are, are more persuasive? Which ones speak to you? Why? How should we evaluate these? What is their purpose? What is their mission? Uh, who are they speaking to? Who is doing the speaking? Um, these are all, this is a great teaching tool. I can tell you, when I taught this in my, my class, it boy, people pop up. Some people are just livid. Some people are defending one or the other. Some people are like confused. And we work through uh, the varieties of interpretation and see this is the way history gets done. 
uh, that evidence and interpretation are, are part of it. Uh, recognizing that both of these are polemical uh, arguments for a way and a lens to, uh, to view history. So this gets me to the end here, and we want to have time for questions. What is uh, history for? Uh, I, I leave these two on, on the screen in part because I think that uh, that what I just described, that critical engagement with interpretations leads to the critical thinking that ends up making us better citizens. Is the history going to continue to change as it has over the course of the last century? Absolutely. A hundred years ago, we taught this very differently. Uh, it was the lost cause. Uh, the Civil War was a lost cause, that meaning it was uh, the war between the states. We did not teach the Civil War that it was all about slavery, and now we do do that. We did not teach about the economics of the plantation. We did, now we do. And I think these are all very positive uh, steps in a long project of wrestling and confronting the past and being honest with ourselves. So what is history for? It's a way for us to get a lens on the past and be honest with ourselves about where we are. And this, um, you know, if we, we could tell a story that makes us feel good, and that is the patriotic education. America, we, you know, had the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, and we fought for that. Yeah, that's good stuff. But there's a giant hypocrisy embedded in there when we say all men are created equal, and yet we're enslaving four million people. Uh, that there's a giant, you know, tension there in Thomas Jefferson's mind when he writes those words. He does include in an early draft a condemnation of slavery, but he's really blaming the king. He says, King George, you've imposed slavery on us. Well, that didn't exactly uh, reflect on the agency, the, the, the actions of the people involved. So, you know, we've got to put ourselves in the minds of those people in the past and be empathetic to what the context around their decisions. At the same time, we've got to call it like it is. Man, that was really uh, central to who we were and not uh, something that we can be proud of. And this isn't pride or, you know, it's like, what are we going to do now? What um, is, what can we do now? If we, uh, how can we take this and what can we do in the moment? First, I'd encourage everybody to keep reading. If you haven't picked up a book yet, there's an interesting essay, essay by Matthew Carp in Harper's that talks about uh, the 1619 Project. I don't think that's been widely circulated. Uh, it's about the political power of history. Is history becoming so politicized that, uh, that, that that's an end in itself? That, uh, that getting the history right is taking precedence over the here and now? Uh, it's a pretty compelling, compelling piece. It was provocative. I had encourage you to visit places. This uh, I told you about my trip in December. The, the family we went to the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana, uh, which is the first plantation in the South to tell tell the story of slavery entirely from the perspective of the enslaved. You can go to a lot of plantations that have been beautifully restored. There's the big house. You can have a wedding there. You can hear about the family that had the plantation. You might hear a little bit about slavery. People are improving that narrative, but it's fundamentally about centered around the big house and the white family that had the plantation. This one is very different. Uh, in, there are other public history projects um, that also are trying to tell the story of, um, of, of structural racism and, and the long history of it. Finally, I think talking, empathy, uh, and listening to people who may not share our views, share your views, uh, I think that's a powerful moment too. How do we talk through this? It's not easy. It's not easy. I want to tell you uh, about uh, and participate. I'm going to suggest participating in community-based healing efforts. Uh, Cynthia Johnson, in her introduction, mentioned one of the things that I worked on, and this was also the same goal of the Chicago of Chicago 1919, a project to wrestle with our history here in the city of the race riots of 1919 and the long after effects of it that introduced things like restricted covenants in response to these riots. Uh, that, that that's what uh, uh, Natalie Moore talked about. Uh, it's it's certainly a a uh, this was an initiative to bring people together to bring them to have those conversations and we we had great events 
Uh, I'm just going to show you one. I like this one. It was our bike ride where we rode through the communities that had been uh, and the sites of the riot to put ourselves back in time. And you could stand in front of a, a two flat in 1919 that uh, whites had thrown a bomb into, a bomb meaning like a, imagine like a Molotov cocktail, an ad hoc explosive, uh, and burned that house down and killed two children. And, and that this petty violence, uh, and petty is the wrong word, this uh, isolated violence that created a reign of terror in Bronzeville in 1919 uh, echoes to this day in where we live and uh, the institutions uh, that remain problematic, like our policing and other uh, lending uh, and other elements that are still challenging for us today. So we took people through this. There, uh, these are the kinds of things I think that we can do to uh, engage ourselves and hopefully get others uh, to engage. With that, I'll stop. I got excited there. We've got a little bit of time for questions, hopefully, and I'll let uh, Cynthia take that away. Thank you, Professor Hutt. We don't have any questions in the chat just yet, but I'm sure people have questions in mind. So while we're waiting for them to formulate them, why don't we see if there are any questions from our attendees in the room? Um, so I'm just curious, as you work with this, which is wonderful, do you feel like people are coming forward um, in the, what, in the, it, forever expanding with this? I mean, because as it gets talked about more and more, it's, it's very sad, needless to say. But do you feel like more people are getting it? And then they, want to move forward and everything's ready for this? Uh, the question Professor was, Hutt, pardon me. Oh, yeah. Please, before you answer the question, please restate the question so those of us on, online can hear. Thank the, you. The question was, uh, are people more people coming forward as to confront this difficult history? Are, am I finding that people are engaging this as we present it? Did I, did I get that right? Is that? Yeah. yeah. There is, there's a positive force coming. Yeah, is, has it been a positive response? Uh, in the worlds that I operate in, yes, I think, but am I in a liberal bubble, in essence, in a university uh, and in the projects that I've worked on where like-minded people are getting together and being like-minded? Uh, that is a concern of mine, but I found that in every class I've taught this in and every project I've done, there have always been some people who come in skeptical. Maybe they leave skeptical, but they've been a part of the conversation. You know, historians like to say we need more history. Now that would be, um, there's a hashtag, more history on Twitter, meaning that we need to go deeper and engage people more and that these are complex stories and that, that if only people knew more history, they would come around. I, I hope that's the case. Uh, I think there will certainly be ideological divides. I don't, wouldn't want to tell anybody what they have to think. I would want them to uh, uh, at least hear the stories, wrestle with them, and come back to their own decision. And that's about all we can do. We have a question in the chat. And the question is, have you faced resistance or backlash for trying to present the point of view of enslaved people more vigorously at Loyola? Uh, I, have not, I have not faced any kind of backlash uh, historians have been teaching this way for a long time. We talk about the agency of, slave, of the enslaved. We talk about the brutality of it. Uh, I, I've been teaching, I've taught the 1619 project in three classes, not once uh, has anyone said anything. Uh, I talked to my friend who's the high school teacher. I said, when you teach the 1619 project, have you gotten backlash? He said, absolutely not. Uh, what they don't want is someone going into the classroom and spending the entire time uh, on a rant against, say, the, uh, the former president. Or, you know, they want teaching, and teaching means wrestling with ideas, and that's what we do. Uh, so, no, not at all. Last week, Professor Daniels shared his belief that he believes racism began in the 1700s. Question is, do you have 
a comment or view about that? Yeah, his, I, this is a very interesting subfield of history, historiography, meaning people have been uh, writing about where do we start the concept of racism. Uh, yeah, it's people are reading into a lot of different evidence. I think the 17th century is is, is a good starting point. Clearly, uh, this, that's not, you know, racism meaning what? Does it mean a scientific notion that people are different and therefore inferior? Uh, that takes off in the 19th century uh, as well. Does it mean seeing um, groups as being able to be uh, oppressed and as subhuman? That's a 17th century uh, perhaps concept. You could probably go further back. Uh, most people in the world rarely interacted with people who didn't look like them until we start this global slave trade, uh, and particularly the Atlantic world slave trade, the Portuguese going down and encountering. Um, most people in their daily lives did not uh, have that experience. We have another question in the chat, and the question is, what can we as Fourth Church do to encourage conversations on these topics? Yeah, I, uh, oh, sorry. I, am, on, am I muted? Sorry. Uh, I, yeah, thank you. I have done a project called Story Circle, and it's a method that we use when we bring people together. And you put six people around a table, you have a prompt, a question. It could be, uh, tell us a story about your encounters with race. That could be a prompt. And you let every single person tell their story, no interruptions. This is hard. No interruptions, no, oh yeah, I, I live there too. Or, oh yeah, my dog, did, uh, no, no, no. Uh, you, you let people tell their stories and they will tell the most remarkable stories of their own lives. And at the end of those six or eight stories, you can then see commonalities, discuss, and you'll be, it's just a beautiful method of listening. That's hard, it's hard for me. Uh, I won't always interject, uh, but yeah, it's about listening. And I think that's as powerful as anything. We have some questions in the room. Cynthia, I'll, right? I'll pause on the chat questions and we'll come back. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry, did you say, uh, let's go back here and then, my question is, um, going back to a question you answered prior to the previous question, and that is, how are we going to teach the 1619 Project to say elementary age children versus the idea of critical race theory? Yeah, my impression is, and I'm not an expert on, uh, on this, uh, what's going on. Restate the question, thank you. Question is, uh, how are we teaching, are we teaching the 1619 Project in elementary schools, are we teaching critical race theory? And should we be doing that? I, that's, well, and how would that teaching intersect? How would those teachings intersect? Uh, first of all, I, I, my impression, um, the, the 1619 Project uh, is not being taught widely in schools yet. I think if anything, there's a session that somebody might do where they borrow an idea from the 1619 Project. You go to that curriculum page and it's, uh, there's a long way to go. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine. I don't know at what age. I'm not an expert on elementary education. I guess I'd leave that to those pros. I'm concerned that the term critical race theory, which of course was an academic theory from law schools in the 80s, uh, is now this umbrella used by those opposed to discussing difficult history, uh, those who fear that we're making kids uncomfortable. Kids are uncomfortable. Uh, I, I, I don't know why we fear that at some level. They can wrestle with difficult things. Uh, I, I think it would be bad if we said, you, you third grader, your great, great grandfather enslaved people, there must be something wrong with you. No, I, don't, I think kids are perfectly capable of realizing that was a long time ago, as my daughter um, suggested, and that, that this past is something they want to understand. They want to keep it real too. I, I just, I think this is a lot of, it's a very strong political play because people are afraid of what their kids get taught 
And if the 1619 project had not talked about a curriculum, I don't think conservatives would have cared that much about it. It's because it's a curriculum that that's the play in Virginia and other states. We were here and here. Is that all right? Thank you. Go ahead. Well, I have a question related to what we talked about. What effect does the fact that the new memory laws have on informing the young people, such as high schoolers and grade schoolers, about the history of slavery? What does memory loss help us to understand the history of how does it inform the history of slavery? Memory loss. Uh, this, I would broaden that question. To, you know, I'm actually thinking memory loss of high school students that they can't. Rem I, they, yeah, some you tell them history and they don't really care and they're not going to remember. But I think memory loss. You mean the lack of sources that we have. We, we, you know, we have a tremendous source material on enslavement from the bureaucratic records of plantations. The the, the ledgers, the notebooks, uh, and that's a, a great deal, a great source for us, but we do not have the voices of the enslaved in any of the same way. We have the work progress during the New Deal, there was a bunch of oral histories done of very old, formerly enslaved peoples. Uh, that's a powerful set of sources. Um, we have a handful of narratives. It's, it's tragic that we don't know more about the experience of the enslaved, uh, and so that historical memory problem is really a source problem. Is that what you meant? Maybe I'm wrong. No, I meant memory loss, I said. Do not teach anything in the school that makes kids uncomfortable. Okay, memory loss. Do not teach things that make kids uncomfortable. Yeah, I, again, I don't know why we were are afraid of, um, of this. Like somehow that we're going to, uh, that kids aren't going to be able to, to manage this story that it's too difficult. I mean, I think there are, you know, s subjects that have to be treated carefully, uh, and there can be bad teaching on this. Absolutely, and I'm sure that there are examples of people taking the 1690 project and badly teaching it, uh, or taking the 1776 project and as commission report and badly teaching it. Uh, that's a problem of education in general. I just uh, this I don't I'm not as concerned. Is this illegal? Is it illegal to teach? Yeah, there's efforts in state legislatures to pass laws to say, don't teach divisive concepts is the idea. Don't teach critical race theory. Don't teach the 1619 Project. Uh, I, I doubt these hold up under any kind of court scrutiny. Um, and I, it's part of a political, this, this sells. If it didn't sell, they wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Professor, we have another question that is related to education. And the question is, can you clarify the difference between education promoted by the 1619 Project and the patriotic, nationalistic education promoted by the 1776 Commission? Can I... Is there a basis of the critical race theory from the 1776 Commission? Uh, the 1776 Commission is fundamentally opposed to uh, any kind of history that uh, it, it's, it, it's not patriotic at its core. And it'll say, yeah, we ought to acknowledge things, you know, mistakes were made in an extremely passive voice. Uh, and I think that passive voice in that report, if you go to that 1776 Commission report and read the passivity in the voice, it's staggering. Like, yes, slavery existed. It's not clear who did it or who was, you know, what happened or any of that. And I think that uh, that contrast between a active history, people making decisions, people wrestling with, uh, the, you know, the, the, the structures and the challenges of of the past versus, oh yeah, that happened, is striking. Um, and it really is two, two polar opposites. We had a question here in the room, is that all right, Cynthia? That's yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. So uh, there was, on um, one of your first slides, there was an image of um, an article that, you know, in reference, you know, slavery, capitalism, and brutality. Yes. I'm just curious about, uh, you know, as far as the articles, uh, in the 1619 project that weren't written by uh, Anna Nicole Jones and the ones that were, where do they like you know, converge or diverge from Marxist teachings about the proletariat and the bourgeoisie? Are they similar to? Or
different from what Mark's talking about. Okay, so the question is uh, some of the other essays, uh, particularly the uh, one by Matthew Desmond on slavery and capitalism, is this kind of a Marxian approach, a Marxist approach to, to the subject? Uh, yes, I think Marx, okay, so when we teach Marxism in, uh, in history, we think of it as class. Think, don't think communism, think class, okay? Uh, think that Marx was one of the first to identify that the social classes are being constructed by capitalism. Once you take people off farms and put them in a factory, you alienated them from their labor in a way, and they're just you know factory drones, and they're not. Uh, and that tension will result uh, eventually. Revolution is, is his thought. Uh, so, is there a Marxian approach in that article? Absolutely. That capitalism, uh, but but it's really about the history of capitalism. So that's an important subfield in the last ten years in U.S. history is to examine capitalism as its own entity, as its own logic. And capitalism, if you're trying to make a lot of money, boy, it helps to have a free labor force. It helps to be able to grow it through reproduction as opposed to purchase. And it. it and how do you extract the most from the labor force to grow the sugar? Uh, and, and that logic permeates uh, the development of American capitalism and helps us understand the labor conflicts of the late 19th century. Again, we're trying to extract as much as we can from labor. Uh, and and that, that, that mindset that workers are expendable, are pay them as little as possible, not treat them with dignity, if you will, is a thread that he traces past uh, enslavement, past the Civil War. And it is a class-based approach, yes. We have time for one more question from the chat and one more question from the audience. Okay. The chat question is, how much thought should we put in the 1776 commission if it was disbanded after President Biden yeah. took office? Yeah, on his first day in office, uh, the president took it off the website. Uh, I think it's an important document for understanding the uh, conservative right today and their grievances. Uh, you know, if they, this idea of paid, what's the purpose? What is history for? Is it for to make us feel good about our country and to, and to somehow um, create patriotic energy? Or is it uh, to, to tell, the, tell our story as accurately and as clearly and as honestly as possible? Those are two very different ideas. Uh, and that's this whole debate in a nutshell. The uh, 1776 Commission uh, you know, has this lots of detail on uh, the, the revolution and the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution tries to apologize for clauses around slavery, it makes this apology about all men are created equal, uh, doesn't see it as, as hypocrisy in the same way that any eighth grader would get. Um, and so uh, it's, you know, yeah, we got to understand what people think history ought to be, and that's at the core of this debate. There's a question in the back. Yeah, how, how might we take a historical approach in informing discussions have an originalist view of the Constitution, especially in light of upcoming Supreme Court mm. selections. Okay, let me make sure I got that question. So, uh, how should we think of this history in light of uh, a legal originalist approach? Did I get that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so originalists in legal theory want to go back to the documents of the time and say this is the thinking uh, in. 1789 and whenever the laws were made, uh, and that that's the central, uh, should be the central focus of analysis. Historians want to do similar work, and when they go to those documents, they're seeing a lot of complexity, nuance. Uh, part of the challenge here is how do you present history to a, a public when in fact it is incredible, you know, that story of Haiti is incredibly complex, not one of that. Thomas Jefferson's thinking is incredibly complex. Lincoln's uh, changing views over time and where he's kind of playing with, uh, you know, he, he at one point proposes a new Liberia-type colony in Panama. 
you know, and that that's a moment. Well, what does that mean? Uh, where is Lincoln on these things? It's hard to get in people's heads at the time. Uh, I think we got to build more context around things. And when we do originalism, we've got to go into the context more. And I think that's a, uh, historians would want more wrapped around a single individual document as opposed to saying, Hamilton said this, therefore that. What else is going on? So more history. <laughs> Good for the business. With that, we are at time. Obviously, this is a very engaging conversation that uh, certainly deserves more time, but we've utilized all of the time we've set aside for the program today. Professor Hunt, thank you so much for sharing your time and talent and your with us today. Um, um, if people would like more information or to connect with you, is there an email address that you can share sure. so they can be in touch? Uh, my email is dhunt1 at luc.edu. And if you, I'm pretty findable out there. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we have come to the close of the program. Uh, I know uh, some people are curious about when this, this series will be posted on the church's website. That is in process, so all of the presentations will be posted and the communications department is currently uh, working on that. So I don't have a date for you, but just keep a watch on our website and uh, you will be able to view the video, the YouTube video recordings. So thank you all once again, and once Professor Hunt, you were just an amazing source of information. We so appreciate you for sharing it with us today. Thank you, Cynthia, for your work in organizing, and thank you all for being here and addressing this difficult history. Thank you.